Uh, next learning objective, we'll look at some sample financial planning models. And uh, the two cases we will look at will be Rosengarten and Hoffman Company. And we'll actually go through a couple examples here of how they actually build their income statement for uh, at least the first few years, and you'll get the gist of it after we do um, year one and year two. Now, year one will be actual. In other words, that's last year's actual performance. It's in the bank. It's guaranteed. And then the future year uh, forecast will be what we're trying to forecast based on the actual results we had last year. Uh, Rosengarten, for instance, is forecasting 25% increase in sales. So we will multiply last year's actual sales of 1000 by 1.25 to get $1,250 will be their sales forecast for year number one. Um, we will assume that costs will go up with sales. And that's a very general um, very, very general assumption that is not always true out there in the real world. We'll do this for this purpose of discussion. But uh, yeah, as I said, if it's a 30-line income statement, each line item, cost of goods sold, uh, SG&A, distribution expense, uh, human resources, for instance, the accounting department, uh, corporate services, um, interest expense, all of these line items on the income statement will have their own separate uh, assumption. For this case, we're going to assume all costs go up with sales. And um, we'll follow that method using this percent of sales approach, uh, which also translates uh, very well. You'll find that there are several ways to calculate these numbers when we do this example. And uh, we'll see what kind of a profit margin comes out on the bottom line. So simply, we start, and it's kind of tedious. You go line by line and fill in the forecast values. Remember, actual is last year. Last year uh, has been completed. And we're moving forward with a one-year forecast. So, what is it going? What will our sales number look like in uh, the forecast year next year? Um, so, simply, we take the thousand-dollar sales figure, multiply by 1.25, and get 1250. Okay. The other way to do that simply is take 25% of a thousand and add it back to a thousand. Mathematically, it's the same thing. Uh, cost last year were 80% of sales. Again, using this percent of sales approach, which is very, very valuable, we're going to forecast uh, the next year's sales. So last year, costs were 80% of sales. This year, costs will be 80% of sales. So I take 80% uh, of my new 1250 sales figure, and I get $1,000 of cost this year. Again, that should represent 25% growth. So the alternate way of calculating it would be to take $800 times 1.25, and I should get $1,000. By subtraction, I get my taxable income, one, uh, 1250 minus 1000 equals 250. The, the other way to calculate that would be to take the uh, $200 of taxable income last year, multiply it by 1.25, and I'll get um, uh, $250. Same answer, uh, just a different way of calculating. I can even go a third way and calculate a percent of sales approach. Uh, last year, uh, taxable income was 20% of sales. This year, taxable income will be 20% of sales, and I'll take 20% of the uh, 1250 and get $250. Um, next, I want to calculate my taxes. Now, the tax rate on this one is 34%. So I'll sit, last year it was 34%. This year it will be 34%. Our tax rate's not going to change. So I'll take 34% of my taxable income of 250 and I'll get $85. Uh, second way to calculate this, again, will be to multiply by 1.25. So take last year's value of $68 times 1.25, and I get um, uh, $85. So $68 times 1.25 is $85, again, a 25% increase. Uh, my net income then by subtraction is just, uh, I would take my taxable income of $250, subtract the $85, and I get a net income of $165. Um, second way to do that, I take last year's net income of $132 times 1.25, and I get the same answer. Uh, again, 25% growth in every category. If you're totally lost with this concept, you can just simply take column one of actual and multiply every number by 1.25, and you'll get the forecast value in this very simple um, method of uh, growing your income statement from one year to the next. I also have to address dividends and additions to retained earnings. Last year, dividends were 44, and uh, additions to retained earnings were 88, totaling my 132 of net income. Again, there are two things I can do with my net income. I can keep it in retained earnings or plow it back into the company or give it away and against a management decision. So if you look at last year's 
actuals we gave away at Rosengarten one third and we kept two thirds. So let's do the same thing in the forecast year next year. So I'm going to keep uh, one third of the 165 and give away, I'm going to keep, I'm sorry, two thirds of the 165 and give away one third once again. So in that case, I'll take uh, one third of 165 and I'll get uh, 55 for dividends and I'll keep two thirds of the 165 and I will uh, plow that back into the company and that will be the one, how I got the 110 addition to retain earnings. Again, the total has to be the total of the net income. So I'll add up dividends plus additions to retain earnings and get the uh, to total net income number. Uh, going horizontally, these numbers should be 25% growth. So my new dividend number in forecast year should be 25% higher than my dividend number last year. Uh, same thing with additions to retain earnings. My div my additions number should be 25% higher. The 110 should be 25% higher than last year's $88 figure. Now, the one number I need off of this income statement that I must circle and bring to the balance sheet is the additions to retain earnings. I'm going to close the books at the end of next year and put that into the retained earning account, as you learned in uh, your accounting classes. So I circle that $110. I remember it. I lock in on it, and I bring it over to the balance sheet. So step two, I uh, then create my balance sheet. Uh, a couple of ratios we can calculate on the way in. My dividend payout ratio, as I said last time, was total dividends divided by net income, uh, which was one-third, and it's going to be one-third this year, too. So last year it was 44 over 132. This year it's going to be uh, one-third of my 165, or $55 will be my total dividend. So I'm going to keep my dividend payout ratio constant at one-third. And my retention or plowback ratio B, I'm going to keep it as the same as it was last year, and it will be two-thirds. Obviously, these two must add up to 100% of your net income. Um, on the balance sheet, we're going to say some things vary with sales, some things do not. Um, if they do vary with sales, we can directly uh, represent them as a percentage of sales. And uh, if we don't, we just put in A, very simply, if they do not vary with sales. So in this case, we're going to say that assets vary with sales, accounts payable vary with sales, De the rest of the debt accounts and the uh, rest of the equity accounts do not. So very simply looking at the balance sheet, then I move to forecast year and I take um, my cash and my accounts receivable, my inventory as percentage of sales. Um, last year, the cash was 160, so that would represent 16% of sales. My accounts receivable will be 440, 44% of sales and so on. So I just create a percent of sales number and just multiply that percentage times the new sales figure of 1250 in the forecast year. Um, another way to calculate my forecast year is to just multiply everything by 1.25. So to calculate my forecast cash, I take the um, 160 and just multiply by uh, 1.25 to get 200. I take the 440 times 1.25 and I get 550 and so on down the list. At the very bottom, my $3,000 in total assets should be 25% higher than last year. So 3,000 times uh, 1.25 uh, should give me 3750. So I have my left side of the balance sheet established and then I move on to the right side. Um, last year in accounts payable, Accounts payable were 300, and I multiply that by 1.25. I said accounts payable do grow uh, in relation uh, to sales, so I'm going to up them 25%, and the rest of the debt and equity accounts do not. So notes payable were 100, they're going to stay at 100. Um, long term debt was 800, it's going to stay at 800. Uh, common stock was 800, it's going to stay at 800. Um, retained earnings were 1,000, and uh, it's going to stay at 1000 The only thing we have to remember now, remember we circled that number on the prior sheet and we're going to bring it into the balance sheet, and that's that 110 of retained earnings. So that 1000 becomes 1110 And then I simply add up my right side of the balance sheet and I ask the question, does it total up to 3750 So I take 375 plus 100 plus 800 plus 800 plus 1110 and I say, does that equal... 37.50 and the answer is no. When I add them all up, I get 31.85. My balance sheet is out of balance. My assets do not equal my liabilities plus equity. I'm in trouble. I can't leave work. I have to balance that balance sheet. How do I do it? I plug it in. Why? It's got to be. The balance sheet must balance. Um, so I have to ask myself, what is the plug? What is the external financing needed that I need to plug into this balance sheet to balance it out? And the answer in this case is $565. 
So if I plug 565 on the right side of the balance sheet, I get a balanced balance sheet and all is happy and now I can go home. Um, my work is done for the day. This plug is called external financing needed. So if I simply plug in the 565, I will get a balanced balance sheet of 3750 on the left and 3750 on the right. Uh, one question might be, where do I plug it? And that can be answered by doing a little bit of analysis. What was my current ratio? Should I put some into current liabilities? Obviously, I'm going to put it on. I'm going to plug this plug in the right side of the balance sheet. Uh, do I put it into long-term debt? Do I want to sell stock? That could be very expensive. Can I increase my common stock account? Uh, in this example, we can see that the um, authors put some of the money into um, accounts payable, and they put some of the money into um, I'm sorry, they put some into notes payable, $225 of the $565. So some went into notes payable and some went into long-term debt. About $340 went into long-term debt. Uh, so there's your $565. $225 into notes payable and $340 into long-term debt. Uh, now, the question is, what was our debt-to-equity ratio, long-term debt-to-equity ratio last year? Uh, what was our long? What will our new long-term debt-to-equity ratio be this year? And did we make a good decision? What was our current ratio last year? And what will our current ratio be this year? So you can look at some numbers, and you can see that our current ratio was three to one last year. Twelve hundred divided by uh, of current assets divided by four hundred of current liabilities. What is it now? It's fifteen hundred over seven hundred, so slightly over two, where it used to be slightly right at three. And we like to have at least a two to one current ratio, so it's okay, but um, we have to be careful with putting anything more into current, uh, current liabilities. Also, long term debt. Our long term debt ratio, debt to equity, was um, 800 divided by 1800, and now it is 1140 divided by 1910, so it's going up, and that could be a danger signal. So uh, we plug these numbers in responsibly, get management's approval, and move on. Uh, with our future years, years three, four, and five of the plan.